thing that I had in there previously. And while you're turning to Psalms 101, it's about acting right in church or acting right as a Christian. That's what the message is. And uh, is, that, that's, is that rough, huh? <laughs> uh, did somebody preach on that recently? Did y'all know Wednesday night the preacher came up here and, and you know, I preached on the Brook Cherith, 1 Kings chapter 17, and then the missionary came in here and said, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> but you know, he, did you notice how he went over the section I was in and he went down to the section? I, I thought that was a blessing of God uh, that, uh, that he, he, did, he didn't use those first verses that I used and he went to the second set of verses. What well, all worked out, you know. But uh, while, you, while you're waiting there and dealing with all that's been said, uh, what, kind, uh, what kind of train, now I'm, I'm giving you these things to help you to get your mind stimulated because we want to get into the message we want people at least thinking, you know. So I have to warm you up here. What kind of train does a pig ride? All right, y'all ready for it? Ham track. <laughs> so now you know the, the vein of thought we're in here. So when I ask the next one, um, what is part pig and part tree? You, no, but you're close. To the, your, your line of thinking is right. Uh, here it is. What is part pig and part tree? A porcupine. See, we're trying to stimulate here, stimulate, mental stimulate. All right, what do you call a sleeping bull? Remember, you got to put these parts together here. A bulldozer. <laughs> it's getting bad, isn't it? Uh, here's one I thought. Uh, what do snakes do after they fight? Something you all do after you fight. Now that man, that man, he wins. Now, you know, everybody does preacher jokes and lawyer jokes, you know, and I don't mind preacher jokes and I hope lawyers don't mind lawyer jokes, but uh, here's one I thought was funny, lawyer joke. Uh, what do you have when a lawyer is buried up to his neck in sand? Not enough sand. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the last one. Why can't you play sports in the jungle? Why can't, you, why can't we have sports in the jungle? Because of all the cheetahs. <laughs> I'm running out of patience for you. Y'all are running out of patience for me, aren't you? Y'all are, your long suffering has passed. Well, with that in mind, Psalm chapter 100 verse 1 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Y'all were doing that tonight, especially on that last song. Y'all were making a joyful noise. Mm, some of the ones before, not so much. <laughs> no, not really. No, no, it sounded good. Uh, and uh, it said, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come up before His presence with singing. So if you look down there in verse number 1 of chapter 101, uh, you get... Um, a song. It talks about a song. It says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Now, a uh, uh, um, Christian who acts right is somebody who's got a song in their heart. Isn't that where one of the Psalms says, He hath put a new song in my uh, heart and, uh, and in my mouth, He's put a new song. And so, you know, what do we, have you ever thought about, now we were just singing, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Could you imagine a Hindu congregation breaking out with that song? I mean, uh, let's go to a mosque and see if they sing songs like that. Their songs have no expression of joy. None. And what you get, I, 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 Yeah. That's it. Christians are the only ones that have songs in their heart that they express. And really, 
uh, if you're doing right for the Lord and you're living right for God, you're going to have uh, a desire to express yourself with, with music, with song. In fact, uh, here he specifically gives, gives the, the uh, uh, reason why and what he's singing about. He says, uh, of mercy and judgment. Now, I suspect it's easier to sing about mercy than it is about judgment. But at the same time, uh, both of them are good. Uh, the judgment of God is, is right and true. And justice comes from judgment. So when people are treated right and done right, and uh, we, we uh, know where God's desire is on our life and, and what He wants us to do, that, that has to do with judgment. And so uh, they, this particular psalmist said, uh, he said, I, that's what I want to sing about. Now, mercy, hey, uh, we have a song we sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Uh, there's so many songs in your hymn book. If you go through there sometime, just mercy comes up about every 10 pages. There's some song about mercy. And what? why wouldn't it be? We had withheld from us that which we deserved. Uh, it ought to make you sing when you know that you have no righteousness within yourself, and then what you think is your righteousness comes short of the glory of God, and then what you think you ought to be uh, given esteem for by God, he calls them filthy rags. And so when you get that concept uh, of God and how God looks at the human heart and the human being without him, uh, then he says, I'm going to give you mercy. Christ is going to die in your place, and he's going to give you eternal life as a free gift. Yes, it's grace, but he also allows us to experience him withholding his judgment and his wrath on us. And so uh, it's worth singing about. Could you imagine some criminal uh, getting uh, convicted in criminal court and uh, he knows that he's either going to be executed or he's going to go away for a long time? And the judge, uh, everybody's waiting for the sentence, and the judge says, you're pardoned. What do you mean? You're pardoned. You're, you're free to go. Me? Free to go? I mean, could you imagine? You think the criminal's not going to go out with a hit, hop in his step and uh, a song in his heart? He's going to be one happy person. And from, uh, uh, from what he could be and where he could be, the judge in that case has said, I'm going to give you the mercy of the court. So uh, it, it is enough to where we can, we can uh, uh, say, listen, I, I know what I ought to sing about. Now, I can't sing about Buddha. There's nothing about Buddha that makes me want to sing, except when they used to have one at China Star Restaurant. You know, you ever gone? They used to have a big Buddha there, and when you walk through there, that Buddha would be out front there, and, and uh uh, you know, you, were, you felt pretty happy about when they finally got your plate of food to you, you know. It was pretty, pretty good. Uh, I'll never forget the first time. Listen, I had some couple preachers met me for lunch. Oh, it was a long time ago. And there was a Chinese restaurant that opened up at Davis Highway and I-10, where I-10 empties out into Davis. And, and right across the street, it was, it was a famous place back then. And, uh, and one old boy was from somewhere in central Alabama and uh, he hadn't been out of central Alabama most of his life and, and but he was down here visiting another preacher friend of mine and, and so we went in this Chinese restaurant and uh, uh, I ordered cashew chicken and this guy never seen cashew chicken in fact he started saying you got peanuts in your chicken and he got louder and louder in the restaurant. This man's got peanuts all over his chicken, he said. I said, no, it's cashew chicken. He got so, he never saw that in his life. We walk out of the building and people are coming in. We were leaving after dinner was over. And people were coming in and eat. He said, hey, folks, you can get peanuts on your chicken in there if you want to. The guy was, you know, it's like, oh, man. But, but uh, one, of, one of the things that w w the unique child of God is that he's got a song in his heart, and he wants to sing. And he's got plenty of subjects to sing about. I mean, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I mean, uh, throw out the lifeline. Uh, 
I mean, you can go on. I mean, there's just endless uh, categories that you can sing about. And so he said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going to make sure that I act right and behave right before God by uh, singing of the mercy and judgment. And verse 2 tells us about the behavior element. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Now, when you read this right here, this actually appears to picture a good king. Now, David writing this psalm, uh, whatever he says in this psalm, it, it, it's apparent that he wasn't uh, necessarily talking about himself, it, maybe in a, in a slight way, but it seems like he's singing about uh, the coming king, the king of kings, because uh, uh, he says, uh, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. The Lord Jesus does that. He is the all-wise one, and certainly he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He was perfect. And when he comes to rule and reign, he'll reign in a perfect way. And there will be all the music and all the praise given to him. There will be a song about him, uh, as, as the Word of God teaches us. And he says, uh, Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? That's the psalmist saying that. I'm waiting for you. Who's he talking about? I think he's talking about the coming king. I mean, what else would we be saying that for? And so all these psalms, it, it, to me, are, you jump in and out. They're prophetic, and they're about the present at the time they were given. And, and I really believe if you read down through there, and if you don't have some explanation, there's many very confusing passages that don't make any, doesn't make any sense at all. But the fact that there seems to be uh, this prophetic speech of the psalmist that tells us not only uh, about the present but the, but the future. Talks about the king. Now Solomon of course was David's son and uh, he was a good king but he was a type of the coming great I am, the great king. And so he says, when will thou come unto me? And then he says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Now devotionally tonight uh, it's the hardest place in the world to walk with a perfect heart. Now, we can walk around church with each other in a perfect way. We can smile. We can say, God bless you. You know, we can say, it's so good to see you. We can say, isn't it wonderful being Christian? But when you get behind those four walls in your house, you know, generally you let sides be seen of you that otherwise you don't show. So being well behaved within your house is not an easy thing to do. Now it ought not to be that way. We don't justify it, but we acknowledge the reality of it. And he says, but when I'm dealing with the Lord, when I'm dealing with the King of Kings, uh, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Is that not what the Lord Jesus would do when he comes and sets himself and rules from a throne there in the temple and he rules righteously? He's going to be perfect in all his ways. He is now. But mankind will see it in a way they've never seen it before in the coming days. And then he, we know that David didn't do this, quite the contrary, in verse number 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Well, we know he violated that. That's what the whole problem of his life became. He did set things before his eyes that were not right. He allowed himself. Now, you know, that's the big hang-up. Uh, through the eye gate comes many a many a problem. Uh, this would be, if you and I did what this verse said and we obeyed this verse, uh, it, would, it would steer us away from a, a, a variety of temptations and trials and uh, trouble. Uh, holding your place there, I, we want to look at something in the Old Testament. I thought this was pretty unusual. Numbers chapter number 33. Numbers 33, I want you to see something that... Uh, gives you an idea how you can be guilty of having the wrong things in your house 
that you, that you look at. Now we know that television is a, a staple that is here to stay. And uh, the idea, uh, and, and truth is, there are great things about television. There are. But there's probably more wicked things about it than there are great things. Um, I, I'm not, I've never preached that you shouldn't have a TV. I mean, that's like preaching uh, at the end of horse and buggy days and cars came out. And somebody said, you shouldn't have a car. And, you know, and there were guys out there that preached that. It was wicked to have a car. So I don't want to get on that board like that. But, but I do know this. Te television and the theater has been the downfall of a many a person through their eye gate. It provoked them into areas they were not normally going to be there in. And, and then what, what's being published in, in uh, magazines. And, and now, of course, you've got the other venue of me media that's overtaken all of them, that's the internet. And uh, uh, the, the awful things on the internet has caused much crime and, and chaos in our society. Uh, in fact, I would say that, uh, it, that we'd, we'd be better off, despite the information that you can get a hold of there and all that, we'd be so much better off that there was never any internet. I think that's been a tremendous uh, catalyst for the dissolution of the family. It's certainly been the catalyst for uh, the lowering of morals across the board. It's, it's sad. It's sad. But uh, Numbers chapter 33 and verse number 52. Notice this. When, when uh, Moses was given the charge to the children of Israel to go over and possess the land of Canaan. And here's what he says to them in verse 52. Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. And notice this. And destroy their pictures. So those wicked Canaanites had pictures of wickedness in their homes. He likened them to the same as and destroy all their molten images and quiet pluck down all their high places. So part of the paganism that the children of Israel was to get rid of as they entered into the promised land was the immoral things they had on their walls. Now, maybe that's a prelude to a flat screen TV. I don't know. <laughs> But it seemed to me to equate to that. Uh, all the garbage that comes across TV. Uh, hey, there are some things that are good and instructive. And some things that are cheerfully entertaining. But boy, that's why everybody goes back to the old shows. Back in the old day where you leave it to Beaver. Uh, Donna Reed show. Remember that? Uh, my three sons. Hey, you look at one of those shows, you say, you see how far America's come in the collapse of morality. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so, you know, at one time, and I guess the devil set it up in his plan, he, the American family was lured in with wholesome, good stuff, knowing his, uh, his mischievous plan was to corrupt the country. And it used to be you had to go to the theater to do it. Then, of course, when uh, cable satellite came in, they were pumping in. And isn't it ironic you can go to the most far out country place in America and see the morals are corrupted there? That didn't just happen by word of mouth. That came through the eye gate from folks allowing wicked things to be set before their eyes. And you know that, and, and, and there's no way to escape it. Had you know, you'd think if you get out here in a uh, two egg, you know, it used to be you could go to places like that, and and uh, you know they were the last vestige of morality. Uh, the old farmer out there in the country, he he uh, he may not even be a Christian, but he he honored God because he knew that all of his ability to produce crops came strictly from the hand of the Lord. They may never darken the door of a church in their life, but they, they, had, uh, they, they, they honored the Lord 
their God. Uh, and so, and it affected the community. The schools in that area uh, were, were the la last ones to give up the Bible. They kept the Bible years after the city schools kicked it out. Um, it, it, just so much has happened that you can point to. It was the plan of Satan, and he knew the, that uh, man has got the problem with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and he hit him hard and, uh, and became quite successful. Now, the sad part about it is Christians ought to be well-behaved, like David was talking about, I will behave myself. We ought to be, especially in this area of not putting anything before our eyes. And so you got a picture of pictures there. Turn with me, uh, if you would, to Ezekiel uh, chapter number 8. Here's another case where you might uh, be able to see that the judgment of God was on... Uh, on those who corrupted their own self through watching and looking at filthy stuff. Ezekiel chapter number 8. Uh, thought this was a great, uh, a great revelation to us here out of the book. Ezekiel chapter number 8, and then look verse 10 and 12. Chapter 8, verse 10 and 12. He said, So I went in and saw, notice the eyes, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed, notice, upon the wall round about. Is that amazing? Verse 10. And verse 9 says, He said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. What do you do? You've got to go look. Go look with your eyes and see. You can see wickedness. And he said, uh, and, God, and God told him, he said, I'm going to judge you for this because you've allowed this junk in your house, this wickedness. He said, you can see all this abominations. You can see it how? You can see it in their house and portrayed upon the wall round about them. That's pictures. That's amazing. I mean, there's nothing that this Bible is not ahead of. Uh, I heard somebody recently say they went in a house and they saw all kind of uh, things around the house, idols and shrines and all that. And, 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 and that's a poor, hey, that's poor. That's a poor way of living. That's a, uh, and, it, and it is an abomination to God. It is. And so David said in Psalms 101, he says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a commitment. I'm not going to set any wicked thing before my eyes. And the problem is he did, as we mentioned. And so there's some things we ought to hate. If we're going to act right, we ought to hate some things. Now, we don't hate people. There's no uh, justification to hate people. But we ought to hate some things. And he says right there in verse 3, I hate the work of them, notice the work of them that turn aside. So I don't have to, you know, today's world we live in, if you don't agree with people's decision or their way, then they say, you're, you're a hater. If they say, uh, let's just take this, if a bunch of people got in and, and decided they wanted to organize as bank robbers, I mean, they decided we're going to be bank robbers. And, you know, we were born this way as bank robbers. And I say, well, no, man, you can't rob banks. That's not right. He's a hater. Yeah, that's the way it works. So you're not going to, you know, it's okay for a, a, a person, a, a, a child of God, to hate certain things, especially the work of those who are doing evil. Uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna try to squeeze us down to the last drop and they've already done that. You see how it works politically. If you say one thing, you're a hater about everything. If you say, I don't think that movement is, is just, I don't think it's based on uh, you know, truth, 
why you, you're the evil one. Now, isn't that what we talked about this morning? That's what happened to Apostle Paul. He just got up there and told them the truth, and they said, that man don't have the right to live. I mean, he just told them about what Jesus did for them. And they were so angry, they, they said, he needs to be removed from the face of the earth. I guess that's what they say about Bible-believing Christians now. We're, we're the change that could be, we're the loose change to them. It's time to get rid of them. And, of course, they, they'll, they'll do it through uh, uh, public uh, uh, ostracizing, which they've already begun. Certainly the media will uh, vilify, which they've already done. And that's been going on for years, we know that, for long before these latest movements have come out. Uh, I, I turned on my, my windows, to, it came up on my screen, this, you know how they have a screen saver, and they had a, a rainbow, and it says LGBT, it'd be whatever, Pride Month. And then it says, do you like this? And I said, no. Well, next thing I look, there's a group of swans floating on the river. Uh, but I'm sure that I've been recorded as a, a hater. That's what they're going to say. And I, and I tell you what, uh, I have no desire to hate on any of these type of people or any of these, anybody. Look, what I believe they ought to be reached for Christ. I believe they ought to be saved. Isn't that what Paul wrote when he talked to him? He said, uh, the, the fornicators and the effeminate and the views of themselves and mankind, and such were some of you, but you've been washed. So, yeah, I, I believe they, they ought to be saved. I don't hate them, but I, I hate the work Amen. that comes from it. I think it's detrimental to any society and devastates and so they, no doubt, will vilify. And then the way, the next thing the world will do it, they'll begin to uh, legislate you out, make it illegal. They've already done that in Canada. Uh, you're not allowed to preach on anything that I've even mentioned tonight. Uh, you can't say it. They'll arrest you. And there are preachers that have gone to jail in the last three to four years uh, because of that. And so uh, that's the way they do. They pass laws to legislate I, uh, I thank God the Supreme Court this past week came down with a tremendous ruling when they said that Catholic social services uh, uh, through their family adoption uh, did not have to acquiesce to these movements. They, and they came down strong for them. And that the city of Philadelphia is the one that had the problem. That nothing's changed, that they believed over 200 years like they believe when it comes to adopting out children, they believed it ought to be a man and his wife, husband, man and woman, husband, wife. And so, so, uh, uh, so that, that had to be, and don't you think that that's going to make anybody go away? They're going to turn it up more notches, the heat. They're going to come at, hey, that's going to infuriate and inflame. And so all of that, he said, um, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. In other words, I'm not fellowshipping with whatever heathen practice people do. I'm not going to have any, hey, uh, there's, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, Paul said. And so uh, it is right. Uh, it's okay. You ought to be kind. You ought to always be kind. And you ought not to have any hate in your heart. But you ought to be firm in obeying God's word. And uh, you do not fellowship. Look, it's easy. I, I don't have any fellowship with a room full of drunks. I mean, there's no fellowship there. Hey, you get around a bunch of people taking God's name in vain. A Christian has no desire to hang around that, you know. I mean, there's no fellowship there. Um, I just say they're all having a cocaine party somewhere and invite you over. Who wants to do that? I don't want to be around that stuff. You know, um, I'm not, hey, I got in a car yesterday with a guy that, though he didn't smoke in front of me, he smoked, I mean, I was ready to get out of that thing. It's an Uber. I was gagging. I'm glad I don't hang around that type of stuff. Not, hey, I know there's Christians who still deal with it, and I understand that. 
but for somebody who's not been exposed to it for about 40 years, uh, it's good not to be around it because it, it, you, it, it affects your own breathing and all that. It, it affects you. And so he said, I, I'm not going to be in, in part of that with fellowship. And then he goes, uh, a forward heart shall depart from me. Uh, avoid bad company. Avoid contact with some things. Have some things that you hate. And, and then cut off slanderers. Look there in verse number 5. Whoso privily slandered his neighbor, him will I cut off. Now I tell you what, the Lord, when he comes back and rules as king of kings and lord of lords, this will be, he will be doing this. I have no right as an individual to cut anybody off. Uh, but the Lord does. And so he says, the people that slander his neighbor, I, him will I cut off. And him that hath a high look and proud heart will I not suffer. So you can see where this is about a king and his, his authority. Not a New Testament Christian. We don't have anything like that. Uh, you know, these people who's, who shot and killed the abortion doctors, no Christian ought to associate himself with that. You shouldn't have nothing to do with it. Uh, but I heard Christians going, well, I'm glad. No, you don't need to be glad about stuff like that. That's murder. That, that, that is not God's. God never gave anybody but the government the right to execute sentences. Not me. I don't have to worry a thing about it. People can live and do like they want. It's not my responsibility to be a judge on them. I can discern God's will based on his word, but I cannot execute sentence. And that's why we have. That's why he puts people in authority to do that. That's, that's the way it is. But a king, especially in these days, in Bible days, where the king was all authority in the land. <laughs> he, hey, he can cut off heads or he can make one, lift one out of the clay and stand him on a rock. He had that authority. But when the Lord Jesus comes back to rule and reign, that's what he's going to do. He's going to take care of the wicked and he's going to support his people. And so he says, uh, him that hath a high look. Boy, there's a bunch of them, isn't there? Folks who think they're so smart. That, and I, I saw where the Catholic Church this week uh, in one of their uh, uh, papers that was written by one of their great theologians, they uh, supported, they've come out now in support of evolution. And uh, I, I'll have to bring the article Wednesday night. It's not, a, it's a legitimate argument based on what they've recently ruled. Now, grant you, there are many Catholic people that's going to be in arms about this. And thank God for those who stand up and say, that's not right. I, I praise the Lord for every one of them. Uh, saved or not saved when they stand up for right and wrong. I'm glad they stand against abortion. And I'm glad that the bishops in this uh, country tried to get something passed that wouldn't let uh, those who support abortion take their communion. Amen. That's great. Uh, I don't think much of their communion, but I'm glad they came out with that view. And so here he says, uh, uh, I ought to, ought to cut off, uh, David said, I'm going to cut off the slanderers and then not put up with proud people. God's not going to put up with pride cometh before destruction. And a haughty spirit before fall. And then he said, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. Mine eyes shall not be on wicked things. But what I'm going to look for is the good folk of God. That's what we do. And, and we ought to uh, admire the people of God. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. And notice you can tell this is a, a prophetic psalm because he says that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. And so uh, the, the Lord of Lord, King of Kings is laying out, of course, all of God's people that will be there in the millennium with the Lord uh, certainly will be walking in a perfect way. Hey, we can't... We can, say that we do that today, but in that day, it will be that way. And he goes, I will, he that worketh the seat shall not dwell within my house. 
I mean, the Lord won't tolerate it. Right now, we're in a land of deceit. We're in a world of deceit. Uh, you know, you're at a place in your life tonight, no matter what comes down the pike, be it medical information, be it financial information, be it political, you believe you're being deceived. <laughs> There's nothing out there I believe. I, this, with all that's come down on COVID, I don't believe it. I don't believe it about the vaccine. I don't believe it about, I, I, no, I believe there was COVID. Now, don't get me wrong, I had it. But I'm saying the message that they sent about it, I believe it's full of deceit. I believe it's deceit on where it started. I believe it's deceit on how it got propagated. Do you see where the Chinese government blamed the American military? You know, early on, they said it was the American military that brought this. Well, you know what it now has turned out to be? It's turned out that, that there were some people in Wuhan, the American military were there in some type of exercise or some type of, uh, of meeting, and they came down with COVID while they were in Wuhan. And when they came back, yeah, I guess that in that case you might say they did. But by that time... All, hey, there was Disney World was full of Chinese people from Wuhan, December and January, and so, uh, but but we've been told all kind of stuff, and it's uh, it never ends, and so the deception, um, God's not going to put up with it anymore. He's he's right now His mercy is enduring, but. When he's ruling and reigning, he will not tolerate it. And uh, he said, He that worketh the deceit shall not dwell in my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Oh, no tolerance. You know, they say, you need to be more tolerant. No tolerance here. <laughs> Zero. None. And he goes, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land. And he will that I may cut off the wicked doers from the city, notice this, of the Lord. Okay, we're talking about uh, New Jerusalem. We're talking about millennial reign. And hey, we, hey, it's where the lamb and the lion will lay down together. I mean, there'll be perfect peace. And so you get all that going. He, in fact, he's going to make all things right. That's the message. So that's... Uh, just give you a quick list. Hate some things, avoid contact with some things, avoid bad company, cut off slanders, don't put up with proud people in your life, withdraw yourself, and get away from liars <laughs> because you're going to get burnt. You and I both. Uh, but think one day, every man will speak truth with his neighbor. That's what the Christian ought to do today. And there's going to come a day when it'll happen. But uh, hopefully uh, it'll be soon and we'll hear the trump of God sound and we'll be caught up together and then uh, we look forward to this rain that he will come and put his feet on Mount Zion. Amen. And it's going to be a great, great time and we're going to live in the presence, the physical presence of the Lord. Amen. What a blessing. I appreciate your attention tonight and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night and uh, uh, get, take some time and uh, fellowship with each other. Let's bow our heads, if you would, together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the word. And Lord, we know that uh, right now we live in a time where grace reigns. And Lord, we're grateful for that. Help us to be merciful to other people, Lord. Help us to learn how to, to reject their lifestyle while at the same time desire to win them to Christ. And we know it's uh, for us humans, it's a tough thing, but God can give us that. We're going to pray that you do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.